Hey, welcome back to the Adoption Option. My name is Mike Blanchett, your host. And uh, today we have a guest in the studio with us. It's, uh, her name is Miss Linda Harvey. Welcome. Good afternoon, Michael. Good uh, to be here. Well, thank you for coming. For those of you that don't know Linda, she is a, a very su successful attorney here from the Merrimack Valley. Thank who you. I've had the pleasure of working with over many years. Usually and on opposite sides. But. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, and also, she's an adoptive parent of two wonderful daughters. Um, and uh, also, she, she is a practicing attorney. Do you still do criminal law? I do criminal law, I do corporate law, and my favorite law, which is adoption law. Uh, which I didn't know until tonight. Excellent, very good. Um, last show, uh, if you hadn't tuned in, we talked about adopting through foster care. I did watch that. You did. and. Uh, now today we're going to talk about international adoption, which you know about and I know nothing about. So Two personal experiences, greatest choices I ever made in my life. Yeah. So if, if we could dive right into this. Uh, first of all, I want to share something with you, an interesting fact. I, I read in Adoptive Families magazine today, and six out of ten Americans have been personally affected by adoption in some way. I, I found that was like so interesting. Well, I think it probably would be nine out of ten if we really sort of talked a little bit more about how adoption does affect people. And in and, and and reading the article further, it's, it's how people were affected is knowing a friend or a friend of a friend or, or family members and such that, um, but I, I just didn't know it was that high, so. Probably higher would be my guess. Yeah. Uh, so you adopted two wonderful girls from China, right? I did. Um, my first daughter uh, that I adopted was, her name is Maxine. She is from China. I adopted her on January 20th, 1997, which was her first birthday. So that made it extra special. And my younger daughter, Talia, who is 11, she was adopted September 6th of 2000 in China, both times. Now, a uh, question, why did you choose China? Well, I think in the international adoption world, you, you look to say, I always advise clients, I advise friends, and the same reasons that I adopted from why I chose China is, you have to choose a country that you're comfortable with, mm -hmm. but also that is amenable to adoption at the time you want to adopt. Right, right. So when I was adopting starting 16 and a half years ago, China was kind of the hot place to adopt. Um, I was also single, doing a single parent adoption, so that limited the countries. Countries, when you're adopting internationally, they have requirements that are very different than they are here right, in the United right. States. For instance, China, back in 1996, you had to be 35 or older. I'm, I'm giving away my age, but that's okay. <laughs> um, you had to be 35 or older to, um, and, and be childless to adopt from China. Really? really? I, I don't know where they came up with and that rule. Don't they have, till this day, they have strict limits as to how old you can be, like an age limit? Well, they have that pretty much internationally. Right. That, that's across the board. Although, on my second time that I went, you could adopt if you were over 30, and you would take a child, you could, you could adopt a second child. No rhyme or reason why things changed, um, and you could be single. And then, you know, for instance, if you, at the time, if I, want, I couldn't adopt from Korea because you had to be married. The Philippines, you had to be Christian. I mean, there are, are really unusual rules. Wow. That's, that's interesting. How, how did you start the process? Do you go, did you go through a, a private agency or a facilitator? Or? Well, I, I asked a lot of my friends and uh, went to a, my, who I be, has, become, has become a very close friend, is a mentor, my adoption mentor, attorney Mary McCabe, who had mm -hmm. done the process just a little bit before, and she had decided on a domestic adoption. And so I went and I talked to her about that. Um, and private agencies adopting through DCF, at the time it was DSS, and when I then decided that I was going to do it internationally, it was a fit for me. I wanted a very young child. Right. And right. I, I am not a patient person. <laughs> so DCF offered, 
years of uncertainty. Right. And that, right. and for some people, it's great. For me, I, I'm not that patient, and right. I need a little more certainty in my life. And international just seemed to make sense because I, I wanted a young child, but I didn't need to have a newborn. Right. And so I had a very good friend at the time um, who had adopted two children from Colombia. So I became familiar with that. And then you sort of shop around for adoption agencies. Mm -hmm. I ended up going through Wide Horizons for Children because she did. Okay. And um, I was very pleased with what they did. Went to their general meetings and said, okay, it's a fit. And so that's how it started. Uh, how much travel was involved during the process? Well, for China, mm -hmm. I had to travel um, to China for about two weeks. Okay, that isn't too bad. No, some programs, um, Columbia at the time, you had to be there for six weeks. Russian adoptions, you have to go twice. Right, so some friends, I was just going to say that, some friends of mine had to go twice for like two, ten days each. Right, trip. every program yeah. is different, and the rules change as you go along. Really? When you think you know it all, all of a sudden the country decides, oh, we're going to have a different agency take over. So the uncertainty is still there, but it, you just, you had to be patient but I didn't wait nearly as long as I would have for domestic. Now, when you're in your situation, um, did, were you matched with your children, or did you get to select or have a choice? Well, they, a you know, they asked ages what you wanted um, for ages, and I, I had wanted a, a, a young child, and that was it. I didn't care gender-wise. Um, and then there's some magical room in China, the matching room. <laughs> Beca well, I'm convinced it's magical and somewhat mystical. Yeah. Because the two children in the world that were meant to be my children were matched to me. So I'm convinced that it is magical and spiritual and divine intervention. But I have no idea really how it's done. Mm -hmm. I got a call from the adoption agency that said, we've got your baby, um, come look at the picture. And that was the equivalent of it. Um, from my first child, I got a picture that was about two by two. She was probably four or five months at the time, it was one little picture. By the time Talia came along, I had these four by sixes. There were four or five pictures of her, so cute in different poses. So, you, so it does change. Oh, uh, it changes over, completely. Like China constantly. changed tremendously from 1997 to 2000. Now, ballpark figure, um, how much would it cost a family to, to uh, start to finish to adopt from China? Well, just a ballpark figure. I want to say probably between twenty-five and thirty thousand. Okay. If you're talking about travel, mm -hmm. um, country fees, adoption fees here, you have to pay for home studies. Um, so that's probably in the five to six thousand dollar range. Depends, you know, travel to China is expensive. Right. Two weeks in China. Um, then you're paying fees to the orphanages, you're paying different fees. Interesting part about China when we went, they would only take crisp new $100 bills. So, During your uh, time in China, during the process while you were there, was there any cultural hurdles or uh, did um, you need an interpreter assigned to you or how did that work? The other reason that I chose China was we traveled as a group. So I wasn't by myself. Oh, so you were with other, we were with other adoptive parents. That we met um, prior to going, and we traveled as a group from the agency. And the agency, as part of your fee, you pay for someone to come who, uh, the first trip was a Chinese interpreter um, who was a young social worker. My second trip, we had a pediatrician that we paid for. So that was wonderful. And there were about 14, you know, or 15 in a group. And uh, the second, uh, to this day, that group remains very close in Talia's case. In Talia's case, and Talia was very blessed. She actually came from China with a little girl who was my older daughter's age. So the three of them have become great friends. They shared a crib, and she lives in North Andover. Now, how old were your daughters when, when you got them? Maxine was one to the day, okay. and Talia was 10 months. Ah, so they were really young, yeah. yeah. And Talia was the only baby in the little group that we went to. And she was everybody's baby there. <laughs> we had toddlers that were two and four. And yeah. those toddlers made sure I had a bottle in her <laughs> mouth. So it was a very, um, it was a, and, they, and we're very lucky. With Talia's group, 
we've connected and we still remain very close. It's our 10 year reunion. What was, uh, before the break here, quick question, what was the total time frames from start to finish? Well, for Maxine, it was just about 14 months from starting the application to coming home from China. With Talia, it was closer to about 19 months. Okay. Well, that isn't too bad. No, not bad at all. In the adoption world, as you know, that's a short amount of time. Yes. yes Extended pregnancies. You hear it, international adoptions, especially, in, as well as domestic adoptions, they, they can last for a long time. And I was very lucky because I had no interruption. Right. Right. As we call it. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we have a surprise. Great. We have another guest. Can't Don't wait go to away. see. We'll be right back. Okay. What? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to put up with you. No, what'd she say? She said whatever. No, she says that all the time. What's that? Hello? I'm on the phone. Mom, I'm on the phone! Hello? I'm on the phone. Who's this? It's me. I'm on the phone. Mom. Oh, you're on the phone. <laughs> All right. Sorry! Sorry. Sorry. Anyway. Who are you talking to? Kelly? Mom. All right. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to put up with you. Welcome back to The Adoption Option. I'm Mike Blanchett, your host. In case you missed the first half of the show, today's uh, topic is international adoption. And with us in the studio today is attorney Linda Harvey, uh, a local lawyer from the Merrimack Valley here, and also an adoptive parent. And now, next to her is one of her two daughters she adopted from China, Talia Harvey. Welcome. Um, before the break, we just got done talking to Linda about her experiences in China and uh, how she adopted her two children. Um, the second half of the show, I want to touch base, Linda, on a special project that Talia and uh, your, your other daughter, Maxine, and, their friend, and uh, yeah. Anna McCabe, they started a charity. They did. Could you tell us about it? They did. Um, Talia Max and Maxine, I think, as long as I can remember, and Anna, have been collecting toys for the Department of Children and Family Service. Mm -hmm. So in 2006, we decided to kind of formalize it a little bit more and we would have it in our garage. And DCF workers would come and they'd get the, the stuff that we collected and they'd mm -hmm. bring it to children. And then when Debbie DiOrio just the most wonderful social yeah, worker in the world an from DCF, woman, yes. yep. um, passed away. Mm -hmm. The girls and I decided, um, and Mary McCabe, that we should honor Debbie's memory. Debbie was our link to DCF. Mm -hmm. So we came up with the name Debbie's Treasure Chest. And then Debbie's Treasure Chest took on a life of its own. It went from my garage to a very generous donation from Sal Lapoli of a warehouse on the Riverwalk where we have right now probably anywhere from 45 to 50,000 items. Wow. wow. And the social workers and their clients um, come in and they can shop. And that's located near Sal's Pizza? It's right above the new Northern Essex Community College located in the Riverwalk. Oh. And we've really expanded. Um, we have, there's no overhead, which has been great because of all the generous donations. And we have workers from the Special Needs Adults Project for the Merrimack Collaborative who are there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday um, from 1030 to 1230. And they run the store. Wow. So it's been, it's crazy. And, and this year, and we, we've raised some money and you know, probably you know, over the years close to 20,000. And this year, we, Talia and I are the shoppers. We do all the shopping. We bought over, we, our donations have been down. I think people aren't giving away 
Well, the economy is tough, It's too, tough. Yeah. And we have gently used clothing, new clothing, books, toys, stuffed animals, toiletries. But this year, we were very low on winter coats. And Talia and I, last year, I think we must have bought 60 or 70 coats. And they were gone before December 1st. Wow. So this year, we gave away, that we counted, about 120, 120 coats. So, lots of kids in Merrimack Valley are, you know, a little warmer because of three little girls who just wanted to give back. That's, that's quite impressive. How, how many hours, like a ballpark figure, do the girls work on the project a week? Well, it's hard to say weekly. Around the holidays, it's a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we have the Merrimack Valley Education, Merrimack Education Project, they work on it less. Now they're doing the sort of different end of it. Talia is designing a new PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. Anna and Maxine are working on a new web page. Maxine's working with a church in, in Lawrence to try to get to talk to youth groups. So they're kind of working at it on that level. So anywhere from sometimes it's one hour and around the holidays it could be 20. I, I was browsing your website. I was going to say you, you made the big time now. The website's impressive. Uh, well, uh, and yeah, I see and, you held, you've held events as well, like uh, I believe a, sp a spring fling. And yeah, we had, um, we had a spring fling where we had a fundraiser, Sons of Italy donated. And then we were part of um, the Leadership and Literacy Foundation where the kids got a, th a hundred backpacks donated from GEMCOR. Or Gen I think that's the name of it. Gem uh, I think it was GEMCORP. Yeah, yeah GEMCORP um, for homeless kids. Yeah. And uh, so it's, you know, it, it's been a great charity. Um, it's really children driven. We just never know what's going to happen with it. Talia, Maxine, and Anna also like it because they can rollerblade right in the warehouse. The dogs like it because they can run. Um, it's, you know, but it, it's, it's amazing. Now, uh, Linda and Talia, part of the charity, these backpacks. Just uh, a part of it. Just a part of it. That's how it started. That's okay. A lot of that. And and people don't realize. Maybe we should just give a little history. If you're a kid in foster care, you, you tend to jump from foster home to foster home. Not always, but there's a good amount of the kids that do. And with garbage bags. With garbage bags, and and foster parents are are actually part of the training. You're told don't put the kids' belongings in a garbage bag. The, the kids' belongings, why are they in a garbage bag? The, it's not garbage. And sub, you know, people don't mean to do that, but it's something handy and easy to put their stuff in. So, it's, and, it's, it's very hard. And because a lot of these kids have been switched foster home to foster home, the vehicle to do that's a car. And a lot of the kids even get nervous when they're going for a, a, a ride to McDonald's or the doctor's office or what have you. And a lot of them when they get in the car, they get anxious and anxiety, uh, and they and they say, you know, do I need to bring my bag, or something like. So, it's a I, whole I think different world. It, it's and it's something normal people wouldn't think of unless you're involved in adoption and, and, and kids in foster care and stuff. So that's where these backpacks came in. I'll let the you backs, take it from yeah, there. Yeah, well, the backpacks came in, and, and the backpacks were really big with homeless kids, because they were moving from place to place, and then it went into foster care. Our goal would be for all, and we'd love all kids not to be in foster care, but right. that's that not a reality. Perfect world, but. perfect world. But, you know, if we ever raised enough money, the kids and I have always talked, and the kids came up with this idea to get not a backpack, because they don't think they could fit everything, like a duffel bag mm -hmm. that would say Debbie's treasure chest on it, and they could put all their stuff in. That hasn't materialized, although we've had a lot of duffel bags donated. But we always think about what goes in that backpack. And we, for, we gave, we've given out many journals to these kids. And things that my children and the, these kids, they, when kids, when my kids work with other kids about, well, why don't you give them out an iPod? And then Talia's response is, but they don't have computers. You know, just those right. kinds of things. So books and journals toothbrushes so that they have the their basic own. basic stuff we take for granted. Exactly. And we are actually dealing too now with a lot of families that the kids are still living with them but because of the economy and maybe some other hard times 
we're trying to service those families through DCF too. Right. It started out just foster kids and the need has grown. But we would love every foster kid or every kid in DCF services to have just the basics. Right. And they deserve that. Oh, they do. It's they the do. least. It's uh, the least we can give them as a society. The big question of the day that I don't want to forget, how can people in businesses in Methuen and Greater Lawrence help you guys in well, the charity? There are a couple of ways. One is they can donate money. Mm -hmm. You can go on our website. You can donate through PayPal. You can send us a check. We are a 501c3, so we're mm -hmm. fully tax deductible, a full registered charity. And um, we always need money just for things like to buy coats. Right. And then we also take items, and that's what we are really in need of. We had a question today about toys. We need toys. Uh, they, we need toys. We need clothes, gently used or new. We need books. We need toiletries. Dentist office, donate you know, toothbrush and toothpaste. We've had them do it in the past. Which we they could probably use it. get from the suppliers or can get from the suppliers. They so it do. probably wouldn't even be a class for them. So they can go on the website, which is triple W, Debbie's Treasure Chest, no apostrophe, <laughs> dot org, um, and they can see our, do our places where they can donate. They can donate at my law office, which is at 184 Pleasant Valley Street, Mary McCabe's office, which is at 375 Common Street in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. The Studio of Dance Arts here in Methuen accepts donations for us. Wow. Renaissance Beauty Salon does, which is at, uh, on East Street in Methuen. So we've got a lot of businesses. Imagine that, which is just above Sal's Pizza. Or they can come to the treasure chest and do it. Or they can call us and we'll figure out how to get it. Now your, your number, they can call your law office at 978-686-9800, right? Correct. And just tell them that whoever answers the phone, you're calling about Debbie's treasure chest. And you, they want to help out. And we would love it. Well, I guess it has taken its own life. It, it has, a That's little bit beyond. That I am so impressed. And I visited your website today. I signed your guest book. I uh, suggest everyone go out there, check out www.debbiestreasurechest.org. No apostrophe. No apostrophe. <laughs> uh, great website. You guys are a great role model for kids your age and even for us adults. Thank you. I, I uh, give you kudos. Congratulations. Um, I just want to take a few minutes. I think we're going to be running out of time soon. We do have a website for the show. And, uh, we saw that today. And the, the website for the show is www.adoption.org. If you have a question or comment, you, there's a uh, contact tab right on the website. You can click that and you can uh, email us a question, a comment, um, and we'll probably read it right here in the air, which I'm going to do right now. Uh, on the last show, uh, shortly after, um, we got a question from a viewer. This is Christine from Methuen. She says, we're an average couple that has rented an apartment for about five years. We always heard that you have, have to own a home in order to accept uh, to adopt a child. Is that true? And I checked with uh, a friend of mine that works at DCF, and as you probably know, Linda, uh, that is not true. And that is not true for international adoption. It isn't. Or okay. any kind of domestic adoption. Absolutely I was false. told as, as long stable as home. you have a stable, you're financially stable, and obviously you have uh, adequate room for the child, you can rent a condo, an apartment, you can own a home, you can live with your parents. Yeah. It doesn't matter as My long as you're financially s stable and uh, you have room for the kid that's adequate. And a lot of love. So what you heard is not true. So Christine, thank you for emailing the show with your question. And again, if you have a question or comment, go to www.adoption-option.org uh, and you can click on the uh, contact tab and uh, shoot us a comment or a question. We'll probably read it on the air just like I did. Um, I think that's about all the time we have today. Um, I just want to end with a comment. Uh, if you're single and you're interested in adopting and being a parent, 
if uh, you might be having fertility issues, or you're just facing a decision regarding an uh, unplanned pregnancy. Just always remember, adoption is an option. I want to thank you for tuning in today, and until next time, thank you uh, for viewing the adoption option. Linda thank and you. Talia, thank you so much for coming today. Will you think of coming back again? Sure, and we'll bring my other adoptee. That would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you.